Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by OS Nexus, Seagate, and Veranext. Um, my name is Lauren Grobe. I am Director of Marketing at OS Nexus, and I will be moderating today. Before we get started, I'd like to point out the question box on the bottom middle of your screen where you can submit questions during the presentation, and we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the webinar. I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, from Seagate, we have Mark Jedrzejczyk, Systems Engineer. From Veranext, we have Edwin Thornhill, Director of Enterprise Architecture. And from OS Nexus, we have Steve Umbihawker, CEO and CTO. So without further ado, without further ado I'll get started and I'll pass it off to Edwin. Yeah, so just giving a quick introduction. I've uh, been with doing end user stuff for 15 years before joining Veranex in 2015. Um, so at Veranex, we are a full stack integrator solution provider. So we start with the business outcomes with our strategic customers and build the the build down from there. So customer experience, whether it's contact center or um, applications, mobile applications, all that kind of stuff. And, and then the backend applications, the enterprise tooling for DevOps that with 4850 uh, in mind there and our hybrid infrastructure. So we, we want to start at the high end and work our way down because you when when a company builds a skyscraper, they don't start at the, at the floor and work their way up uh, on the design. Um, they need to know what the requirements are above them before they can build out everything down there. And we are uh, keeping everything security and compliance uh, in mind, uh, very strong security team, obviously automation and AI in order to keep things uh, efficient and moving through. Uh, so that's a quick little introduction on what, who very next is, and uh, we will continue on with the program at hand. Thanks, Edwin. All right. Yeah. And then, oh, sorry. I've got the slide transitions. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, so I'm going to start off with uh, a little overview of the challenges in object storage, and then Edwin and Mark and I are going to talk to just uh, some of the details of how we solve those problems in the follow-on slides. But just sort of setting the stage and, and some of the uh, challenges in that area and and uh, how we work with Veronext and Seagate to solve these challenges. Um, so one of the biggest things is just dealing with super large data sets. And so this presentation is really focused on object storage because it's really an ideal protocol and, and architecture to be using for massive data sets. And the solutions that we're going to be going over today go and cover everything from the you know, hundreds of terabytes all the way up to the hundreds of petabytes. And uh, we use some special techniques to handle those configurations that are, that are uh, over, uh, especially those that are over 100, 100 petabytes that we'll talk to. Uh, one of the other challenges uh, and, and really uh, a costly one is, is the forklift upgrade that, that most organizations have to deal with, with uh, uh, upgrading is, systems of all kinds, whether it's file block or object, but it, it's especially important to eliminate the forklift upgrade. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's just, you, you never wanna have to have users have downtime and, and that's that's a challenge that uh, organizations deal with today. Uh, the higher durability requirements is, is uh, also super important when you're looking at an object store as you're gonna be maintaining this object storage in kind of perpetuity as as an organizational archive, and uh, and so you know typical five six nines of of uh, durability are typically not high enough, and so we'll talk to how we how we get to much higher levels of durability, and then we're going to talk a little bit about immutability with object storage and and those features and how you can use those to protect your organization and the uh, cost efficiency of the uh, architecture uh, that that we're going to go over, and so. This is, uh, you know, solving those those challenges, kind of just like the previous slide. But we we um, uh, we're going to go over some double layer erasure coding uh, techniques to get to the durability. Uh, we're going to talk about how we eliminate those forklift upgrades, uh, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, immutability. But we can also, if you've got questions around uh, other areas of security around multi-factor authentication, you can put those in the questions. Uh, area and we can we can talk to those as well. And overall, uh, this architecture really helps organizations save save a lot on their object stores while also giving them better performance and and flexibility with their object stores. Uh, and and one of those things, uh, one of the ways that we're, that we're able to do that is by doing a, a combination of the software technology with Seagate's Core Vault. So Mark will 
be talking to that as as we get uh, further into the deck. So with that kind of setting the stage, uh, we'll dive right into uh, the kinds of solutions that, that we build. So we, uh, with this architecture or using the Seagate hardware and the Quantastore software, we're able to do both scale up and scale out uh, configurations. And the scale out configurations let you just start with as few as four servers. And in this case, what you're looking at is uh, these AP, where you see AP, that's a server blade inside of a chassis. So Seagate makes a specialized server that Quantastore integrates with. And you get two servers per per chassis. So when we do a scale out architecture, like you see in these uh, two uh, uh, rack level configs on the on the right, um, we're starting with at least four. But in this example of of a rack uh, using six nodes, uh, you can just build upon that by just dynamically adding capacity and performance just by adding uh, more uh, core vaults and more uh, storage nodes. Uh, what's neat is, is that we don't have to go and change the hardware or the software to do a scale up architecture. So if you have a need uh, for something that's, you know, under a few petabytes, we can do that with a single uh, uh, AP unit with the dual nodes and make a highly available solution there. But for the talk today, we're really focused on the scale out where you're taking four or more nodes and turning that into an object storage uh, config using the software. And uh, we'll get into the erasure coding and some of the other features of the core vault unit in this in this talk too. So this next slide is on uh, data placement. So when you go and set up uh, an object store using Quantastore, uh, you'll go in and, and set up an object storage zone. This is just like creating a zone inside of AWS and you can name it just the same way that you would name it AWS, AWS zone like US East dash one. And we actually recommend that for maximum compatibility with just a broad spectrum of software that's expecting to talk to AWS with the S3 compatibility and using naming conventions like uh, those used at AWS. So you get maximum compatibility across all, all the various applications out there that are uh, that use uh, that integrate with Amazon or yeah, Amazon's S3. Um, but I wanted uh, to kind of pass the baton here and have uh, Edwin uh, talk a little bit to kind of dynamic tiering and, and how that's been important for some of your customers. Yeah, so we have a, a, a shared mutual customer that wanted to combine multiple different clusters of MinIO. Um, they were not taking advantage of Flash today. They were having some issues with uh, driver placements and that sort of stuff. Um, and we wanted to consolidate that, but that also meant we need to be multi-tenant, which some, a lot of the, the com, uh, competitors could not do the multi-tenancy in a scalable way either. Um, but with this, we were able to uh, take the small objects that that would take IO performance away from the spinning disks, have fewer spinning disks, have a little bit of a flash tier, and and prioritize that data down to all or, or up to all flash, however you want to look at it. So there are two separate storage classes as described in the image. And data can flow between them without having to be readjusted by the cluster. So we can um, run processes on an automated basis to to kind of shove the the colder data that's in all flash is not really being accessed anymore, shove it back down to to the hybrid to, to be more cost effective while keeping the the more access stuff within all flash, which is a pretty unique um, functionality with an object storage because it's not object does not tier like a a flat a an array does like a hybrid or a block array does. Uh, so we were able to, to, with the maturity of the product, as well as the agility of OS Nexus, uh, be able to provide a very unique solution there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just being uh, uh, able mm -hmm. to, uh, like you're saying, you know, move the data and auto tag the data on the front end, just kind of uh, uh, eliminated a lot of need for the customer to make adjustments to their applications. They're just able to kind of flow that in and, and start replacing the MinIO uh, infrastructure, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, let me jump to the next one. Th this slide goes over uh, how we're able to eliminate the the complex data migrations that's typical there with, uh, you know, object storage and, and other types of storage. Uh, and the way that we do that is we make it so that as you add more and more data, you can go and expand that at any time by just adding more systems into the cluster. So, you can start with an example here with four nodes making a uh, a uh, an object storage zone that's maybe using two plus two erasure coding, and then as Edwin was getting at, you can change and move data between different storage classes later on. So when you go from a four a two plus two erasure coding 
to say a six plus two, uh, you can make use of that greater uh, space efficiency as you expand your cluster. And you can see the data just re-levels out across the cluster as you add more and more systems. And you can even mix and match uh, using different types of hardware. So in the future, if the systems have bigger devices, so if you're starting with the latest uh, you know, Seagate uh, 20 terabyte drives and then adopting uh, the Mosaic 3 Plus drives in later generations of your cluster, you can do that. You can mix and match the older, smaller sizes with the bigger sizes and just keep rolling things forward in, in perpetuity. And one of the other key things, you know, there's there's a lot of systems out there that are that are good at expanding, but it's really actually super important to be able to contract the cluster to phase out old hardware. And you can do that here as well. We just reweight these old systems when you're ready to go phase them out. So as the thing fills, you can reweight this initial system down to zero. It'll flow all the data out of those, and then you can remove them from the cluster. And this lets you just keep rolling the software forward on a new hardware uh, and not have to do those those forklift upgrades. And Edwin, yeah, maybe you could speak to some of the kind of challenges in the past you've had with uh, forklift upgrades. Yeah, and some of the the other um, options that we've uh, done in the past uh, when we're making a major change, especially in the hardware level, um, they, there was a tightness of integration there that didn't allow us to really easily um, do that in a, in a consecutive manner. So the, the best course of action at the time was to set up replication between the two clusters, the new cluster and the old cluster, get the data over there and then repoint all the applications or DNS records over to the new new cluster. Um, that is not necessary in this in this use case because we can expand and contract very easily across generations, across different sizes and configurations. Um, it just uses what it can, the, the system automatically uses what is there based on, on the weight values that are automatically assigned to the system automatically. Yeah, totally. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and here, yeah, this, the, as, as I mentioned, you can recategorize that data as you grow. So if you start small with a two plus two and later you've got like 16 nodes, we can change that up to like 12 plus three erasure coding and add those additional storage classes. And, and, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, like you're saying, Edwin, it just, ends up saving a ton of time and uh, uh, angst with regard to having to deal with uh, the big migrations, yeah. Uh, this slide goes into the durability gains that we get with combining the hardware and the software. So uh, we're gonna go into a bit on the Core Vault and uh, Mark, could you pass the baton to you here on, on a little bit on the Adapt? Sure, thanks Steve. Uh, so ADAPT is an erasure code that Seagate has that's part of the package uh, within the controller. So Seagate has their own ASIC and this sits inside the ASIC. And uh, ADAPT has been out since 2017 is when it first uh, entered into the, the industry. And it's based on a, on a RAID 6 algorithm. And it allows us to have either an eight plus two or a 16 plus two, 16 plus three type of configuration within the, the array itself. So this allows us to be able to do very quick rebuild times on hard drives. So because it's erasure coding, we understand where the critical data lies within the drive itself. And we can remove that critical data within minutes and allow the, the drive to uh, become healed and uh, rebuilt. So um, we have another technology we can talk a little bit about as well, ADR, autonomous drive uh, regeneration. But as far as the ADAPT goes, it's, it's really uh, basically made to really do fast rebuilds on these large drives. So as the drives get larger and larger, I mean, we're at 26 terabyte hard drives, 30 terabytes are coming out uh, with the new Mosaic uh, 3 plus and it's, it's allowing us to really take advantage of those large drives without worrying about how long, you know, a week or, or two weeks to do a rebuild on, on that particular drive. So again, you know, usually within, you know, a few minutes, we can, um, you know, get that drive ready for uh, another failure uh, in that RAID set and um, start to work on that rebuild and, and then rebalancing out the system. The nice thing about this too is this is all done inside the box. So the erasure coding is occurring inside the box, which means we're not going to be traversing the network every, you know, so often, you know, saving about 15, 20% of your network bandwidth, uh, not having to update the OS on where, where everything is. When we're done, we'll just let everybody know it's done and, and you're off and running. So 
this stays, uh, you know, uh, kind of the east-west type of uh, direction within the uh, the arrays themselves. And, and there's like an NVRAM in there as well, right? So the, the writes are getting logged? Yeah, so we actually do a split write. So when we do, um, when we're doing our write, we're writing to both controllers at the same time through a, a patented technology called Simocache. And that allows us to write to both controllers at the same time. And it sits in an NVRAM. In case there's a power um, hit on the array itself, that NVRAM holds up um, with super cap technology. There's no batteries or anything like that in the, in the uh, array. And next time that array uh, it comes back up, it will read that NVRAM on the way up and then commit those writes to the drive so you don't have any type of data corruption. Very cool, very cool. Um, and and basically we're we're layering software RAID over the top of that when you're, uh, or software erasure coding rather, over the hardware uh, erasure coding when we do these scale out clusters. And so you're you're getting this double layer of durability and this is exactly how you know the the public cloud providers operate their really large clusters. You get to kind of bring that to your own private cloud, and combining those two layers, you know, if you've got like six nines of durability at the software, six nines of durability at the hardware, there's some really cool data science that's uh, uh, work that's been done over at Seagate. This is an app that they've developed in house to do this Markov chain analysis to go figure out what the level of durability. Uh, is of any given architecture. And, and when we combine these two layers, a good example, you know, you, you can get 14 plus uh, nines of, of durability in these solutions. So exactly what you want when you're thinking about, hey, I'm not building a solution for four to five years, but I'm, I'm building a solution for decades to come that's just gonna keep rolling forward. You know, having that, that peace of mind of, of that extra durability just makes it so that you can go to the data center to do the drive replacements when you want to, and there's no the kind of typical urgency that you might have had in the past can can uh, uh, be subsided there. Uh, all right, and yeah, and as Mark was getting at the network impact, so much lower uh, just kind of goes away when you're having that the durability inside the chassis, uh, getting those those drive rebuilds uh, separated out. So. Uh, Mark, yeah, this is uh, that kind of going into more detail on the rebuild times on uh, with the adapt. Right. Yeah. So you know, as you can see, when you get up into these 106 drive adapt um, core vault systems, you're looking at about 25 minutes before your your fault tolerant again. So an average um, rebuild time is about five hours on um, you know on a on a single drive. So this this is uh, far better than a traditional RAID system, which is you know if 55 hours with uh, with little workload um, being hit. So we've we've been in situations where uh, people have told us that their workloads uh, are pretty high and their 20 terabyte hard drives uh, have gone to, you know a week plus and doing a rebuild in a traditional RAID you know enclosure. But when they get into the adapt. These are done within hours, so um, it's freed them up to, you know, as far as being able to sleep at night, not worrying about another uh, um, another drive uh, going down within that RAID set and uh, being vulnerable there. So this is definitely, um, you know, something that's been around for a while within our technology since, like I said, 2017, and uh, you know, we continue to to make um, you know strides in, in development as uh, new new technology comes available to us. It, it gets updated into the firmware. That's so cool. And yeah, and speaking of new technologies, the the ADR stuff too, that uh, uh, being able to remanufacture the drives right within the box. Yeah. So the ADR, the autonomous drive regeneration is a, a newer technology that's been out for about two years now. And what that's affords us to do is to, you know, being Seagate, we, we're, we're the manufacturer of these hard drives. We'll, we're also the manufacturer of these arrays. Um, and we also manufacture the, the controllers and the ASIC that's inside there. So it really puts Seagate in a unique uh, position in the industry where we can talk to our own drives with our own controllers. And, uh, you know, being the manufacturer, actually run some manufacturing tools on, inside the box. So uh, if, if a drive were to throw an error out to the controller, we can then uh, take the critical data off of that drive very quickly and assess what's going on with it, maybe run some diag diagnostics on it, uh, kind of con configure, actually see what's going on with the drive. If a head is is uh, being um, misused or, or, or um, 
been um, damaged, we can actually take that out of service. If a platter is uh, suffering some different issues, we can take that out of service. So we can remanufacture that drive inside the array and then bring that drive back online and then rebalance out your system all without you really having anything to do with it and not your users wouldn't uh, know what was going on because we have so many drives in the system within that pool that we're utilizing. So our performance really is not uh, um, impacted when we're, we're going and doing this in the background. So we can bring that drive back up and running and get it back up to a 90, 95% you know, utilization and allow you to not have to worry about replacing that drive. Uh, the whole goal of ADR over the next you know, five years or so is to really get to a point where you not have to uh, worrying about replacing hard drives for the life of the system. And you know, this being two years into this technology, we've made a lot of strides into um, figuring out what these errors are on the drives and, and um, we'll continue to do that. So over the next few years, this will get only get better and better and um, less drives will be replaced. And that kind of behooves, you know, it's a win-win-win for everybody when we do that because we're not adding these uh, drives with precious metals back into landfills. We're, we're able to utilize them for the life of the drive. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and just less trips to the data center. So less, less, uh, having to, to, uh, get out there. And, uh, um, yeah, like you're saying, I, 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 it's like less in the landfill, just, uh, just, a, it's a nice kind of green, uh, technology in a lot of ways. Um, that's, that's, that's and, awesome. And, and, and just from a performance standpoint, we talked about limiting the performance impact while doing the rebuilds already on the RAID stripe because this is not RAID stripes. Uh, you can have mixed drive sizes. So when that drive comes back online at smaller capacity, it doesn't matter because you're doing ratio coding that RAID. Right. And then that lastly, the we we kind of hit on a little bit before is the the object storage system as a whole is not having to do anything. It's not having to move data around. It's not having to push anything across the network. So it's not using any more CPU. It's not using any more um, overhead on the on the front end of the system to handle this type of failure. That's a really good point, Edwin. You know, on on a on a bigger Ceph cluster, when we're doing larger quantum store deployments, and there's, uh, you know, thousand two thousand devices in there, you, it's just a normal thing to have a drive uh, healing happening on the in the cluster on a just a general day to day basis, and and that just goes away with the core vault technology in the mix because all those drive rebuilds are now localized, and there's no more network load and. And it just adds this whole another level of uh, of durability. So yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> so this next slide kind of dives into a little bit on the security benefits of object storage. And um, for those unfamiliar, uh, there's you know object storage in general doesn't let you do modifies. When you modify an object or you're effectively uploading a new version of it and it does versioning. So you can have an old version and a new version of the object. And for security and compliance reasons and, and uh, you know government compliance to, to, to various uh, regulatory standards, um, there's these new modes that were introduced, uh, a compliance mode and a governance mode. These are you know standard modes available in, in AWS, but now you can do this on-prem and set your buckets to uh, compliance mode, which means that the, the object cannot be deleted at all. So it's a life cycle policy that says, hey, I'm in compliance mode. None of this data can be deleted for one year. Uh, and then at the end of that term, it takes the lock off of it, but leaves the data there. Uh, the, the data, if you want data automatically removed, that's done with a different policy. So there's a immutability policy that's separate from a life cycle policy. So you could have a life cycle policy say, hey, I want to delete data that's five years old, but I want it immutable for compliance reasons for, for one year. So these modes are really critical to protecting against things like uh, ransomware. And uh, and then there's some other features like legal hold. But Edwin, did you did you uh, uh, have some have some things you wanted to speak to on the markers and things like yeah, I mean, the important thing here is, as we all know, when something comes in and does something malicious to the environment, uh, it tries to to overwrite the data with corrupted data, right? Or encrypted data, not corrupted. Uh, something that they can roll back upon payment of a ransom. Uh, one thing that this soft versioning gives you the ability to do and, and locking gives you the ability to do is basically put the move those um, 
soft deletes onto the new objects and re-expose the original objects. So we don't have to do any fancy rollbacks. Um, we don't have to pay a ransom to get this data back. It, it is still there and still available. Um, and a, as mentioned before, there, there's uh, a lot of different ways to do this and, and, and to, to level up the protection as well. So this is very similar to, again, going back to what a lot, a lot of interest people will, will recognize is on the um, array side, you can do a safe mode type setup where it will automatically create snapshots on a regular basis throughout uh, so many days and hold those and not allow those to be deleted by anybody um, so that you can roll back quickly. This is this gives us that same functionality on the on the file object side. Yeah, uh, the, totally. And it, it's uh, it, it, it integrates with uh, backup software. Most uh, pretty much every backup software platform out, out there nowadays integrates with object storage, but uh, recently done a certification with Veeam. So you can use this with Veeam and, and, and other uh, platforms that will explicitly use the compliance mode and uh, to, to do that kind of protection. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, like Edwin was saying, you just, you can peel off these delete markers and there's your data back. And then the, the, there's that legal hold feature, and, and that's just, um, you know, if you've got uh, a need to put a legal hold on some set of objects, it's another layer of protection. So let's say, you know, you have uh, 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 a policy that's going to delete data after, you know, five years. Uh, if you have a legal hold on it, it'll just not allow anything to be deleted that has a legal hold on it. So it's just like a permanent uh, lock that you can put on it that's separate from the, tip, you know, the standard immutability settings. Uh, so that that can be really helpful if you're trying to just permanently hold certain object types. Uh, you can just go in and sweep through and, and apply legal holds on them. And this uh, ne next one's about uh, uh, bucket replication. And so one of the key things to to sort, you know, once you have an object store set up, is uh, how do you replicate? How do you get a second copy into another data center so that you've got a DR site? And how do you do that in a cost-effective way? And uh, the way that uh, uh, OS Nexus Quantastore is priced is uh, based off of capacity. So when you go and do that other site, there's a, a discount that you're getting uh, as the capacity grows. And there's some additional discounting that we apply on uh, these Core Vault-based configurations. But they uh, basically, you know, through a few clicks in the web UI, you can go and set up uh, replication from one cluster to another. And it bidirectionally replicates the data. So if you go and start writing data via an application into a zone like US West 1, it'll automatically flow to US East 1 and US South 1. So you don't have to go and write any special software to replicate uh, in reverse direction or forward direction. It's just bidirectionally replicating uh, at all times. Um, And yeah, you can you can also have asymmetrical zones as well. So you can go and set up like the West zone uh, using an erasure coding level like 16 plus three, and maybe your primary zone is US East and you're using eight plus three for better performance. Uh, so you can mix and match and you can have different generations of hardware. Uh, so just a ton of different flexibility around that. And uh, uh, Edwin, you were asking earlier about uh, individual bucket replication. Uh, uh, that that's uh, that's a good thing to point out. We also have the ability to do uh, uh, flows, uh, basically setting up uh, groups of buckets that replicate in a particular direction, but not in the reverse direction. So if you wanted to just take a set of things in US East 1 and replicate it just to South or to, to block it from replication, you can also set up these contr controls over groups of buckets to do special things. All right, and this a uh, couple of things on the on the web UI. So uh, the Quantastore control plane spans uh, all of the systems, uh, all of the Seagate uh, servers, the AP servers, as well as the core vaults to give you a distributed control plane for managing all the hardware and the object storage all in one. So you can log in, set up the whole cluster, uh, manage it all through a, a nice distributed control plane. And that control plane can manage multiple object storage clusters. So just like in that previous slide where you're seeing like the different uh, uh, object storage zones that are three separate clusters for east, west, and south, uh, you can put all those clusters into what we call a storage grid 
and then manage all of that through uh, through the APIs, CLI, and, and our web uh, interface. And the web interface is accessible across all the nodes simultaneously. And then the security features around applying policies to your management users, that applies across the entire grid. So if you say, hey, I'm, I'm enforcing a particular security policy and two-factor authentication or uh, LDAP uh, authentication, that applies across your entire uh, storage uh, uh, storage grid uh, across all the clusters uh, at, uh, at all times. And then there's integrated monitoring uh, of, of all the hardware stack as well. So this is a little bit on the hardware integration. So it's not just the, you know, the software layer, but we're also deeply integrated with all the Seagate hardware. This is showing a Seagate 5U84 system uh, with uh, two nodes. Uh, in it, and we combine multiple of these together to do scale out configurations and we can use uh, other models of uh, Seagate AP224 with the core vaults as uh, architectural option as well. But here you can see all the drives are green, they're all healthy. But it, if we detect a predictive drive failure, uh, we can pull that dynamically out of the cluster, unweight the device and send a call home alert so you know to go and replace it. Uh, and that's another kind of key thing uh, uh, is that we we work closely with Seagate on the support side. So we get give a unified support uh, by through OS Nexus takes uh, first call. And then if there's a hardware thing, we diagnose uh, down to the component and bring Seagate into the into the ticket because uh, we've got a, a integrated support organization. So you don't have to jump back and forth. Uh, you can go and work directly with uh, Veronext and the team at uh, at OS Nexus and and Seagate together as a team uh, through through the integrated support uh, system that that we've developed. And that uh, takes us to the Q and A slide. So um, I'll pass it back to to you, Lauren. Yeah, we have a few questions here. Uh, so the first one is um, can you talk more about how this solution uses a mix of hard drives and flash storage to optimize performance and usable capacity? Yeah, I definitely can do that. And the, the important thing there is, again, it's, since it is two pools, um, we do want to make sure that it's sized properly for the workload. So um, going in and looking at the data as it sits in the existing environment um, and calculating how much capacity is actually used by those smaller objects that that are are performant and need that extra amount of performance on the, the flash media um and then be able to to um, balance the system out that way so um we, we have a sliding scale of basically any, anything we want to we can make it as all flash if we wanted to or or down to five to ten percent flash if we needed to to go down down that low as well so anything in between so it's all it's all part of the preparation architecture that we put in the effort to work with the customer to, to size out for them. Awesome. Okay. So the next one is, does this solution integrate with the cloud? Yeah, we, uh, uh, we have some policies where you can set up to do some replication to the cloud. But oftentimes, uh, one of the best ways to do that cloud integration is with uh, some of the sync features of some of the utilities that are out there. You can use um, AWS's command line utilities like AWS CLI and use sync mode or mirror. Uh, one of the best utilities out there is S5 CMD that you can use to, to do sync. Um, but there are some features around bucket replication that we're investigating around being able to go direct and set up a replication policy to go direct into uh, like AWS uh, S3, but kind of one of the primary ways that we do data data migrations is just through um, these, these a whole bunch of different uh, command line uh, utilities that are out there that that give us parallelism in the copy process. Great. Um, next question is: What kind of performance can I expect with a scale out configuration? The design tools are kind of like one of the best resources for that. So if you um, put in Ceph Designer into Google and actually these links right here that where it says resources, you go to link.osnexus.com SDS STX dash scale out that link there. It'll bring up our scale out design tool. And what we've done is over the years collected a lot of performance data uh, from different clusters and uh, from performance testing and then taken that that data to make some equations that'll give you a synthetic performance calculation based off of 
real world data. So when you see, uh, when you put together a design, you know, you can select a variety of different Seagate models uh, right through that design link and ch change the size of the cluster, change the erasure coding layout, all those factors adjust uh, the uh, uh, overall performance in terms of IOPS and throughput. And so that's just a great tool to just go get a, you know, rough on target uh, performance uh, guesstimate or estimate for, uh, for any given configuration. Okay. And then this one kind of goes um, off that one. Can we start with a scale up configuration and later move to a scale out configuration? Yeah, that's the, the scale out gives us that ability to kind of roll the hardware forward just by adding more equipment or removing uh, older equipment. Uh, unfortunately, with the scale up, uh, we can expand it, but we can't contract it. Uh, and so then there's kind of a pivot point that, that we see on some deployments where it's like, okay, we need to go from a scale up and switch it to a scale out. And there's a backup policy feature in Quantastore where you can say, you know, I want to take all of these files that are in this folder on my scale out pool, and I want to copy them to my scale out pool. And so you can copy the data over uh, automatically using the, uh, the, the uh, backup policies. But there is a, a copy process that you have to go through, a data migration uh, uh, plan. Uh, and, and that's where, you know, working with, with uh, Veronex, working with OS Nexus, we can help you with those data migrations if you start with a, a scale up and switch to scale out. But because the software and the hardware is all the same, one of the neat things is, is that when you move all the data from your scale up uh, pool over to your scale out, you can then take that scale up, that hardware that you're using for scale up and add it into your scale out cluster. So you can kind of pivot and dynamically uh, take hardware that was used for a scale up use case and then use it for scale out in the future. So, uh, and we'll help you with all the license transition if, uh, if there needs to be new keys generated, uh, all of that, we assist you with that at, at uh, just uh, contact OS Nexus support for any help there. Okay. Um, next question is, what is the process of administratively deleting buckets? What is the process of, of administrating or the... Yeah, I, know, so I think... Probably. Yeah, you can administratively, uh, you can you can set the object deletion to be done through a uh, through like a lifecycle policy, but you can go right into the web UI and delete buckets, and you can also use the S3 API to delete buckets. Sure. Um, of course, if there's a, a lifecycle or, or, or rather a data governance policy uh, set on the on on it, so that such that the bucket is mutable. Um, uh, with a compliance policy or a governance policy, it's going to prevent you from deleting that bucket. Uh, so there, it, it depends. Assuming that it is deletable, uh, you can delete it through regular S3 APIs. So if you're using anything from like S3 browser or command line utilities like AWS CLI, you can delete it administratively just using uh, uh, you know the the keys. Uh, user keys that have access to uh, that that own that particular bucket, but you can also do it right through the control panel as well. Okay. And then um, how does the deployment process work and how is support handled? Yeah, the deployment process is uh, we work together as a, as a team uh, to go and do these deployments. And there's a pre-go live checklist that we send out ahead of time. One of the biggest things that that, that seems to take the most time is, is I would say networking. Ed, Edwin, do would you say that the same? Yeah, any scale out system, whether that's hyperconverged or whatever, networking is is the the keystone that ties it all together, um, and needs to be right in order for the 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 deployment to go well. Yeah, yeah, uh, like LACP and getting all the VLANs, just kind of all that that upfront stuff. Uh, but with that kind of sorted, you know, the deployments go really quickly. I'd say, you know, Mark, that that one that we did recently, I, I think we had the whole cluster stood up in a couple hours. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it took uh, about an hour to um, get everything configured and, and OS Nexus loaded. And uh, within two hours, we were moving data from one cluster to into the into the new cluster. So it uh it was uh, the customer was extremely pleased on how quickly it was to to get up and running and how easy it was to actually maintain it after that and 
they were doing all the, the heavy lifting at that point, um, moving data in and out of the, the cluster. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, um, it just, um, yeah, as you know, it just through the web UI, we're able to kind of stand up and configure things and, and uh, really do everything uh, right through there. Um, so it's uh, it generally the deployments go really, really quickly, but yeah, we work, we work together as a team, you know, Edwin is, is uh, you know, on the, on the architecture side, planning out, getting getting a lot of things uh, prepared ahead of, ahead of time and then when our deployment team is is as out there uh, and working closely with Seagate like with Mark uh, we're all you know working together from you know anything that's ranging from uh, the uh, bare metal you know configuration of IPMI all the way up to setting up the cluster and uh, we include uh, some amount of time for remote uh, configuration but on bigger clusters we kind of recommend, uh, doing on-site deployments uh, just makes it a lot easier to kind of uh, work through any things that any hiccups that uh, uh, that are you know people might run into or questions. It's uh, it's we recommend uh, allocating more time uh, depending on the size of the cluster. Great. Well, that was the last question. So thank you to Steve, Edwin, and Mark, and to all of our attendees for joining today. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Lauren. Bye. Bye-bye.